Elena Mustakova Posart is next as our speaker. So Elena lives in Virginia in the United States uh, and has a, a practice in Virginia. She is a spiritually oriented social cognitive developmental psychologist and psychotherapist with a strong commitment to the intersection between scientific psychology, spirituality, and psychotherapy. She works with adults and couples around issues as diverse as life purpose, depression, anxiety, addictions, relational problems, and marital dysfunction. And the focus of her presentation today is a new initiative uh, related to trauma healing in the Baha'i community. So welcome, Elena. Thank you. First of all, I want to start by thanking you, Suzanne, for this initiative to bring us together. Very much looking forward to the consultative part of this meeting so that we can start learning from each other, which really wouldn't have happened without your initiative. So that's very valuable. Much appreciated. And uh, also want to thank the two colleagues that we just heard for their excellent uh, presentations on two extremely helpful and highly specialized approaches to the treatment of trauma um, that are truly quite valuable, each of them, um, as we're making a shift to, in some ways, a rather opposite approach, which is this third presentation. Um, this approach is different in two ways. First of all, um, in, my, uh, in my presentation, which is on behalf of a team of people who are here, uh, Albert Lincoln, Melissa, um, Earl, Jay, Hannah, and Vincent, this is our team, you can see, uh, and Mojde, uh, this is our team, we're all um, here on screen today. We have been working together to try to focus on the very particular aspects of trauma in the Baha'i community. So until now, we talked about all kinds of trauma in general. This third presentation really focuses on trauma in the Baha'i community. And the second way in which uh, it's a shift is um, it was our intention to shift from highly professional and special, specialized interventions to developing interventions that, while informed by professional understanding, can also be facilitated by community members. So there are four community members by community members. In other words, the idea was to consult on ways in which we can open spaces, compassionate spaces in our communities where all of us can learn to really share and heal together and accompany each other in this process. Um, and I'll say a few words about why we felt that was really important. Uh, while there are many populations around the world who unfortunately suffer extreme and systemic traumatization because of beliefs, um, faith beliefs, um, ethnic traditions and other also are forced into migration and a sense of isolation and end up forming uh, diasporas in their uh, recipient cultures. And that unfortunately is a very, very common and sad story. The US is interspersed with such diasporas. There's something very unique about the Iranian Baha'is that suffer similarly. And what we felt was so distinctive is that Iranian Baha'is suffer in the name of a very heroic ideal. And there is an assumption that when we suffer in the name of such a high ideal, and this is an implicit assumption, it's never spoken, but it appears to be very present, that when we suffer in the name of a very high ideal, perhaps either traumatization does not occur in the context of staunch faith, or if it occurs in that way, it can be overcome silently by prayer and meditation. And there is, there appears to be in our observations, a tendency for highly traumatized Iranian Baha'is and their families to be disinclined to view their suffering as trauma. When it is viewed as sacrifice in the name of an ideal, uh, it is very difficult to accept, to even consider that this nonetheless may have left trauma that requires healing. And so we 
very strongly felt that this heroic narrative, which is so unique uh, in the Baha'i community, especially in the Iranian Baha'i community, and so central to our faith, uh, needs to be complemented with an acknowledgement of the impact of trauma in the Baha'i community and developing approaches that allow us to really um, address this in ways that are humane and culturally sensitive and are communitarian in nature. We also felt that because of this unique traumatization, which really um, in most cases cannot and does not get acknowledged except as voluntary sacrifice, um, hidden traumatization in fact gets in the way of the ability of Baha'i communities in, in many cases to genuinely connect to the experience and uh, hardship of other um, groups and group members that join Baha'i spaces. The experience of the Iranian Baha'i traumatization is so specific and so intense and can in such ways dominate perception that um, the rest of humanity that joins our spaces and brings unique other kinds of challenges and often traumatization um, is not, does not always feel equally able um, to share their experience, to have that experience received and fully understood. Sharing spaces uh, overall can be a bit of a challenge. And so we felt that we could do a lot better in, in terms of uh, facilitating such community spaces for everybody's sake. And particularly for the sake of our Baha'i commitments to building unity in the world, a united world, which means our ability to relate to every kind of trauma, to relate to every form of hidden suffering uh, with equal openness and equal receptiveness and heal together. Um, so this is the context of our focus. And because of this context, we um, also employed, um, and so far you'll probably notice that I've been addressing question number one from the discussion questions uh, quite directly. And question number two is, what are some professional community-based and cultural ways to effectively address these particular types of traumas that we see? And what we felt is that uh, one way, which is both professional, but can extend beyond uh, professional members of the community, is the need for greater community education on the psychological and emotional reality of trauma, so that the stigma of trauma and recognizing trauma can be removed, can be lifted, and that this can become a topic that can be openly shared, openly explored, openly understood along with its impact. And we also felt that, again, there is a need to learn with the help of professionals, but not just professionals, what it means to open safe community spaces, what it means to share, to process together, what it means to really connect to the suffering of each other and accompany each other in that process, to deep listen to each other. On the one hand, these are professional skills, of course, uh, but on the other hand, they don't have to be limited to professionals. They really aren't. And uh, they would be a great gift to the whole community as we learn how to listen to the sufferings of the whole world and the complexity and diversity of the whole world without judgments and without preconceived notions that we already know and we already understand. So um, this was something that we really wanted to focus on. And we felt that it could be done on a community-based, um, uh, in a community-based way uh, by developing materials and resources that could be shared with communities and could promote a reflective and self-reflective process in which people who potentially, and families who potentially carry unaddressed silenced trauma could uh, become really protagonists of their own process and develop their own ability to really recognize, identify, 
the possible presence of, of traumatization within themselves and their families without having a professional point that out to them. Um, and also become protagonists in assessing what kind of resources or methods uh, might be most helpful to them. In other words, again, approaching the human spirit as noble and empowered and able to reflect and understand. And so some of the methods that we have been uh, focusing on in our consultations, um, there are several. One was developing a questionnaire that there's self-reflection questions that would allow people to perhaps identify um, manifestations that they may have not previously recognized as associated with traumatization, but they could see that they could potentially be pointing to some traumatization in the families. Um, another uh, method that we're also working on currently, um, and I didn't mention that our team has been at work for about three months now, uh, is developing um, vignettes, which are individual stories that reflect the many different faces of trauma. So these vignettes, which are always composite vignettes, um, tell different stories of, of uh, traumatization within the Baha'i, Iranian Baha'i context and different journeys through that. And in that way, allow uh, fellow Baha'is to hear, to recognize, to identify without being directly pointed to. And then a third method, of course, that we were, um, we have started working on is really developing uh, a range of resource materials that could serve both for communities to, to read and be more familiar uh, with the many manifestations of trauma and also ways of treatments, such as some of the specialized treatments that you've shared and others. Um, and also materials for LSAs to use when these kind of things come in front of them before, uh, because we know that um, all kinds of complicated family issues come before an, uh, LSAs. And oftentimes the members of the uh, LSA are really not um, specially prepared to deal with these issues and are often not able to recognize in these issues the hidden uh, impact of traumatization. And both uh, previous speakers mentioned that, that um, there are many ways in which traumatization will affect and does affect particularly close personal relationships and family relationships, and they can, may go unrecognized. And so developing materials and helping people have sort of a background education brought to this phenomenon, just in the same way that we know, for example, how um, various substance addictions affect people. Um, this is a resource that we feel could be very, very helpful to the Baha'i community. And some specific challenges that we are currently looking at and trying to reflect in our vignettes, um, I'll give just some examples. This is not, of course, an exhaustive list, but um, I probably should preface that by saying that the team was very carefully selected. Um, I specifically invited on this team people that I know are uh, both dedicated Baha'is, have some connection to the uh, Iranian Baha'i experience, some of them very direct, their, their own uh, traumatization or traumatization of a parent, um, extended family. And these are also people who have done the personal reflection and healing work, people who were at one point at a time when they did not even know they were traumatized and they walked the whole way to awakening and healing. And so they really understand the journey, are compassionate and, and have really firsthand understanding of what it means uh, to do this kind of awakening. So. I have found that to be very illuminating working with this team and learning from every one of them. Um, so this is my opportunity to express gratitude to everybody on our team. And here are some of the examples that we are trying to implement, embed in our vignettes, which we're currently working on and the questionnaires. Um, one example of, of uh, the traumatization in Baha'i families who live and continue to live with a very heroic narrative of self-sacrifice is that there are often struggles with emotional connection. 
that could be struggles with emotional connection between partners or so between uh, par um, parents and children, difficulties with emotional intimacy, difficulties with deep emotionally attuned listening, and a focus on external uh, behaviors. And oftentimes that's associated with uh, very unrealistic high standards for children, adult children, uh, for others. Um, and all of that, of course, is in the context of, of the lived experience of extreme sacrifice. So that's one aspect that we uh, recognize that needs to be somehow compassionately reflected and uh, reconstructed. As much as you heard, much of the work on healing trauma is the process of reconstructed understanding. Um, of memories and the way they're connected to current experience. Another okay. aspect that we- uh, Elena, you've got about one more minute. Perfect, I'm finishing. Thank you. Another aspect that uh, we also are trying to reflect is uh, sometimes strongly held opinions about differences um, within the community that may be accompanied with uh, a need for a much greater understanding of the struggles of other populations and other people. Um, there can be also a tendency, very common tendency, to be unaware of the physical uh, sensations and experience and a tendency to push through hardship without self-awareness. Very typical for people who have learned to sacrifice. So these are some examples and also the last one that I want to mention that we're also trying to integrate. We often see a, in, in families that have lost everything and sacrificed everything, a compensatory emphasis on uh, achievement, social recognition, sometimes even material wealth. And all of these things are uh, very innocent and unrecognized. So we're trying to weave all of that into vignettes an open space for reflection. And we're also selecting a body of uh, excerpts from the writings that we find very helpful that will uh, in fact stimulate reflection in community gatherings. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Elena, for, for sharing with us.